ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to our program. My name is Muhammad Taufik Hidayat. I will be the moderator for these sessions uh, in the day three of Bandung, the first Bandung International Conference on Social Science. Uh, today we have two outstanding keynote speakers with us here, Professor Merlina Lim and Professor Fran Weizens. For the first uh, keynote speakers will be Professor Merlina Lim. Uh, before we start our presentations, uh, I'd like to remind every uh, participants that come to these uh, sessions uh, to mute their speaker during the presentations in order to avoid any disturbance during the presentations. And then after the presentation, they can uh, turn on the speakers uh, to join the discussion sessions. Okay, for the first time, I would like to introduce the first, our first keynote speaker, Professor Marilena Lins. I would like to read uh, her short bio. Okay, for Professor Marilena Lim is a Canada research chair in digital media and global network society with the School of Journalism and Communication at Carleton University, an Align Media Lab founder or director and associate professor of communications and media studies. Uh, Merlina Lim's research interests revolve around the mutual shaping of technology and society and political part of technology, especially digital media and information technology in relation to issues of justice, democracy, and civic or participatory engagement. Her educational background cover PhD cum laude in science and technology studies from University of Twente, and then the graduate certificate in internet studies, summer doctoral program, Oxford Internet Institute, University of Oxford, United Kingdom, and then master of science of architecture cum laude, University of Parahyangan Bandung, Indonesia, and bachelor of architectures with honors, architecture, Institute of Technology, Bandung, and uh, she has been awarded more than $2.8 million in research funding from the Social Science and Humanities Research Council, the Canada Research Chairs, the Canada Fund for Innovations, the Ontario Research Fund, the US National Science Foundation and Nonprofit And then um, she also has attended, more, not attended, speak on over 200 presentation talks nationally wow. and globally, over 100 media coverage, including The Guardian, Al Jazeera, and CBC News. It's been a long list of her outstanding achievement. I can read all of them, but uh, Professor Merlene is uh, such an uh, outstanding person. Okay, without further ado, Professor Lim, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for that very generous introduction. For your information, I didn't submit that bio, so I didn't know someone's gonna read all right? <laughs> <laughs> read all of those things. Uh, I almost don't recognize myself. <laughs> anyway, uh, I will share my screen. So, what I uh, what I will share to do to, to you today is uh, basically is literally pretty much what I have been going through in my research. It's more like, uh, I'm not gonna telling you what, how to do research, but I want to share you some of my experience, the big picture of my experience in doing research in this field, uh, which is quite long. I mean, since I started doing it, like as a, as a graduate student, uh, it was actually 20 years. My first publication, literally, it was, uh, I think it was 19 years ago. So 2002, uh, so it will be 20 years next year. And I wrote that as a graduate student before starting my PhD, from Panopticon to Pandemonium, right? Uh, and, and I think though my, so my, uh, I'm, I'm getting older, obviously, I become a more senior scholar, but I think there is something fundamental that was there that going through. And then I think I would like to 
to invite young scholars to actually be encouraged as well. So it's not, it's not you don't have to be old to be a good researcher. <laughs> You don't have to near that, you know, like becoming like very close to graveyard to create your your hmm. best uh, research. You just keep doing. Sure. You just keep doing your best, basically, right? And uh, so it's sort of like looking back on my own, own journey. The title is Critical and Socio-Technical Research on Digital Media and Society, an inter interdisciplinary approach. Uh, I never know what kind of discipline I am located with, but I'm very comfortable to juggle between discipline uh, now. I used to not be not comfortable. And I think you. I would like to focus on this word, critical and sociotechnical, what does it mean? Um, while my focusing on digital media and society, essentially what I'm talking about would also be able to be applied to any research entailing the relationship between technology and society. Uh, technology has become more dominant in our society and research, there's so much research on technology, but I think generally there's, there, is that, there is still a tendency to treat technology as something external from society that has impacting, right? If you re read journal, it's like the impact of such technology on society as if technology is a powerful thing that direct the society, which is we call techno-determinism. And then you have the other one, which is from so the more humanistic, socio-humanistic that really doesn't really unpack technology itself, believing that you know technology is a black box that's, so you have this kind of like one way type of research. There are many research on, on social media, for example, that's very case by case. Or oh, Twitter during the election, it is negative impact and then become positive because of the case, which I think there is something is really flawed there because technology don't become, it cannot be positive one day and negative the next day and neutral the other day, right? So what we need to, know, to do is kind of research that is kind of like go beyond just like very simple uh, relationship between technology as a tool and the society that is being shaped, but it's more like complex reading that allow us to really understand how technology and society actually together mutually shaping in each other and going through uh, what I call co-evolution. They grow together, right? And I'm blessed to be able to look at uh, the internet from the beginning. So my research 20 years ago was about the internet and, and society in Indonesian politics. And, and uh, I, I have done, I will show you that I've done other research somewhere else. But when it, when it comes to Indonesia, I look how the technology itself is changing from static web, the way we see techno internet at that moment was just the screen with, with text-based email lists. And now we have mobile phone with WhatsApp and social media, right? And so the content is changed, technology is changed, the behavior is changed, the user are changed. How do we grapple with this uh, complexity if we don't actually have a conceptual understanding and of course, with conceptual understanding, we also will change the way we do our method as well, rather than like isolating ourselves within the confine of disciplinary, right? Like if you are doing communication, everybody doing content analysis, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, then, and then like, oh, if you are anthropologist, the only thing that you do, you are only comfortable with ethnography, mm -hmm. right? And then your political scientist just reading news and then doing this all, you know, <laughs> this kind of like textual analysis that is so different. And then, you, you know, so, and then you have this data science now, but just looking at big data. So I don't think this is actually a very healthy way of looking at it. I think complex issue needs interdisciplinary approach. And I'm a, 
a big proponent of interdisciplinary approach. So that's where I come from. Uh, just, just to show you, in, in case some of you don't really know my work, this is a kind of like uh, start showing what I've been doing in the last 20 years, um, almost 20 years and up to 20, 2024, I still have a project, which is essentially is about mutual shaping of technology and society. I look at the human connection through time and space, whether it's through studying collective, collect, uh, social movement, collective action, urban movement, and I'm interested in the alternative production of knowledge or epistemic culture. This is uh, uh, my main, probably the, the longest trajectory of research is about Indonesia, but I also doing Middle East uh, and Southeast Asia and other country in Asia. So you cannot see this because it's so small, uh, but this is, I prepared this because I think in the last two years, in the last one year and a half, people started to ask me on sort of like to give a more longer, long durée of my research and how I do research, which is I think very much in line with what, what I was asked today. And I started to think about looking at as if I'm someone else, right? And trying to conceptualize my own experience into a kind of like how to make sense uh, of doing research in a very fast changing landscape. And I think, uh, so this is kind of like my research. What I, you could see what my research is and there is a like sort of like political event and my research. When there was a moment when everybody in my university who were doing anything related to communication, they were doing cyber terrorism. I was in Arizona at that moment after September 11, because the money was there. And I refused to do it because it was trending, right? I could do it, but I was thinking like, if everybody doing that, and, and who is doing cyber terrorism? It's less than 1% of, of the Muslim world, right? Because it was like some sort of like very Islamophobic uh, moment at that moment. And I said, how about Muslim who are pro-democracy? Pro why nobody doing research on that? So before September 11, because I learned from Indonesian case and Malaysia, you know, no religious entity is monolithic. You could have, and, and fundamentalist doesn't mean they are terrorists. So what I said, you need to look at broader picture. So I was, I was actually advocating to look at pro-democratic discourse, how the internet was used by people in authoritarian countries such as Egypt, Saudi Arabia. Uh, at that moment, Bloc was prominent. Tunisia, I was very interested because I, I went to Middle East often for other things. So I was thinking like, I'm interested in that. That was before September 11. I wrote a proposal about that. And we got funded because because the uh, uh, Arab Spring happened, which is, of course, I didn't predict it would happen, right? But months before that, I was thinking these are there's something going on that people were talking about 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 uh, a certain aspect of democracy, not that people are practicing democracy, but there's something about moment. It's not even about democracy, I think, what we heard. So I think the way we look at what happened in the world and to, to think of what happened online could actually be hijacked because online is easy. You could just like, okay, let's go somewhere and then focus on very like tunnel vision. Uh, and that's very dangerous, right? You need to look at online as but being part of reflection of what has happened offline and without knowing what's actually going on offline. Mm. The reality of the world itself, the real world itself, sociopolitical world, 
we would be skewed by what we see online because you you see what you want to get right you get what you want to see you you google up going certain hashtag and then you come you are directed by very small subset of your research rather than rather than anchoring what you see within the broader understanding of of societal construct uh, construct so there's just a so this is how I always like to look at this somewhere else. I never really, because I think like, like, and then of course it become part of larger discourse because you're kind of able to be engaged uh, in larger discourse once you understand more than just event. So event, moment, cases, they're important, but they need to be part of broader story within time and space which is historical right because what we what we experience today is a moment today this uh how many minutes that i'm going to be talking about uh, about this research is part of the event which is larger this is the episode event but then you have more we have to understand long durée in order in order to really understand the relationship between A, X, and Z in this in this case is technology and society. And also I think when I think about social media in my research is actually, it's not just tech because media, social media for me, like I look on how coffee shop might be related to mobile phone, right? in connecting human being. Where do people gather, for example? Like how urban spaces, how mosques and churches and temple might be connected to the way people are collectivizing using uh, social media as well. Like in Hong Kong, churches and smartphones are becoming one, right? In Indonesia is actually recently, right? Uh, student association, most that are near universities and social media. These are very important social, social media environment that enable certain type of collective actions to emerge, right? Like during Jokowi especially. Uh, so, so those are, those are my, my sort of like outlook on how to do research. And I care about speciality temporality and materiality of this relationship. Speciality is, is like for every single little local is actually there is a larger scale. The, so everything happened not only locally, but also globally. Something that looks like happening globally is actually anchored within, within certain different speciality, which is local, right? Especially in digital media, because there is no boundary online. But at the same time, going online is not doesn't always mean going global. You are bound by language, for example. Indonesian are connected with other Indonesian on Facebook, on Twitter. Are Indonesian going global? It is global, but it is actually locally bounded, right? People actually collectivize finding friends whom they are. They are within the same space, especially during COVID, for example, right? Organizing the neighbor, the neighborhood organization, finding who are living in Bintaro, right? So to think about how to connect different speciality when you try to understand technology and society. Temporality, I was talking earlier about temporality, which is there is event, there is moment, there is event. And there is history, how different temporality actually connect to each other. Certain, for every single thing that happened today, it would, could we only be explained what, what happened before. Why I'm here, because I had conversation with, with Dr. Asep Iqbal. And actually, how did he knew me? Because he's been reading my stuff and actually read his stuff too, right? We, if before we actually engage in conversation. So the explanation of why certain things happen, certain moments, certain episodes happen actually could be only explained by 
subsequent episodes event that happened before. In other words, you to have to know the historiography of certain things to understand. So history is very important as well. Even when we are talking about hashtag Twitter, that seemingly like a spur of moment, it cannot be explained by just a spur of moment, but explain what unraveled before. Materiality is talking about, I was talking earlier about that, that's a smartphone and churches, right? Or mosques, how they are connected on why certain society develop different kind of tendency in, 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 in using certain technology is actually defined by the materiality of technology itself. And the fourth aspect that I always, always uh, uh, try to emphasize in, in, don't forget about the human. That's, yes, Twitter is helpful sometimes, or WhatsApp, or, but who are the actor, the main actor that connect all of this? They're human. I think to, to always go back to the role of human, human-centric approach, that human always have agency. It's not like, oh, social media is bad because everybody going to echo chamber. No, echo chamber are enabled by human behavior, right? Uh, or algorithm. They are not all powerful technology that direct everybody to be to behave certain way is actually algorithms are designed and being direct filled in by human behavior and therefore algorithm and human being that become one and then having influence on the, how we collectify, organize or communicate with each other. This is just very, very quick. Uh, I think uh, the sort of some, I will gloss over very quickly. So it's easy to, to be enamored by something that is bling bling, right? Oh, what is trending, right? Oh, there is like, no, a certain hashtag is trending and then you go there. I think, uh, but that's not a good reason when someone is trending or what, why you do research because you could, it's not a good, I think what we have to uh, ask ourselves is why do I care? Why should I care? Whose story I, do I need to tell? And it is never about me. It was about things that matter that I, we want to understand something, not because I just want to understand something, but it is because we want to contribute understand certain understanding right of the world around us and i think for me doing research on indonesia for example is always about is actually a personal and moral act as well it's a part of my contribution being part of that society and being part of my academy at the same time um, I, I said earlier that sometimes we are trapped in in discipline uh being disciplinary is important. You cannot just like, oh, I have no discipline. Certain discipline is, I'm interdisciplinary. What does it mean? You need to know what it means. But I think to choose to choose certain methods, not because our discipline push us to do certain methods, but because our problems, our research problem, push us to choose those methods, right? So. Theory comes from empirical and problems and methods. Methods shouldn't come just from the disciplines, but come from a kind of question we want to answer. And so th this is just, just an example. Uh, so I'm still studying digital media. And right now, actually, I'm sort of more into critical communication or media studies. Uh, but in terms of methods, I'm using ethno-historical, which is coming from sociology, anthropology, science technology studies, uh, use computational mapping, social net analysis that's from data science. I, I, ha I have background in architecture, urban studies, 
and he, uh, that's socio-spatial analysis is always uh, prominent in my research. And of course, content and discourse analysis. Not that you have to use all of them all the time, but I think to, to, to be open to different approach that allow us to understand better, right? Sometimes I use two, sometimes I use three, but it to have is sort of like uh, not being dogmatic about certain certain techno certain methods is is a good thing, I think. And and sometimes probably I'm undisciplinary. Tidak punya discipline. Yeah. Baong. So uh, yeah. I'm into undisciplinary movement. So people who don't want to have discipline, you could join me. Uh, uh, this is again, right? I know this is a rather hard, probably in Indonesia, that uh, sometimes people do certain research and certain way because they want to be published in some places certain way. I think that's also not... Uh, if you can, you could, you could, you could uh, negotiate, right? That for me, this is where I publish. Of course, there is a sort of like unwritten rule that because no, I'm in communication, therefore I should be re publishing more in communication. But I think what is more important is to ask ourselves what, whom, and how to communicate to whose audience. And then it's more important, right? And then if your piece is like excellent anyway, it would be easier to go to places that we decide to publish. So as it's a sort of, it's not necessarily don't publish in certain things, it's not, but I think what, what it is that when we write, what is it that we want to communicate? I think to have principle that going back to my point about personal and moral act as a researcher, I think, uh, it, it, it's really helpful to stay through to the course of your research. So this is like a, uh, it's not, oh, I should do this method, but I think what's asking what or which methods should I use so I understand best, right? Uh, I'm, I'm a thinker, but also a thinker. So I like doing like a puzzle thing, right? Oh, this is, I could do this and that. And, and all this pandemic, of course, I cannot do offline hangout, but I could do online hangout, right? Uh, and do other things. So, so sort of like having more than one repertoire, in, more in your repertoire of methods is helpful. So yeah, so it's multi-method allow, allow me to do historical as well as real time. So the combination between is what I call a temporality, right? Online and offline, inter and transdisciplinary. But I also started to, to look at small and big data, new media and old media. Uh, uh, I like to visualize because it's allow me to do sort of like uh, reflect, but also the critical reflection and reflexivity, reflexivity at the same time. I will focus a little, I will uh, take time a little bit on the notion of small and big data. Big data research kind of take up, take us by storm in the last probably 10 years, right? Because it's just easier, right? To mine data, you get, you get uh, easier to a certain degree, right? But I think I'm not against big data research, but I think it's important to know that the advantage of doing social science using big data or how to choose, right? Uh, I mostly medium, I don't do million and million. Um, well, my, 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 my t-shirt is also medium size. So, so I'm like sedang-sedang saja. Um, uh, I think I'm doing combination of small and big data. And why is that, right? Because I think what, what the big data doesn't necessarily make you get richer data. 
big data is understanding about understanding what people do, right? What people tweet, what people post online, what kind of words that are often, how many times some, something is tweeted. So understand the immersion, right? So you immerse in big data to understand the pattern, behavioral data traces. But you wouldn't understand, you cannot know why people do it, what motivate them, what are the reasons, right? That's, you could only find out, so you understand the pattern, but then why this is this happening? You cannot, and so, so if you write about using the term why and then using just big data, it's a flawed method to do. So to understand our foreign behavior, you have to be immersed to find out under the underlying meaning through small subset of data, which is using conversation. Why did you tweet this thing? How did you know get to know the certain hashtag, right? Uh, uh, where do you hear, right? Whom do you know? So these are these are like underlying meaning is to get deeper is, is actually, uh, you have to go to small data. So you could choose one or the other. Uh, but in order in really understand, in order to really understand the complex relationship between human and technology, is actually you have to combine these two, right? These two, that's we will understand everyday habitual practices by really have a really deep understanding. At the same time, you understand larger pattern. Uh, and this, this changed the way we do certain things that are such as ethnography, for example. Typically, traditionally, right, doing ethnography is doing snowball sampling, for example. You go to the village or, or to a certain neighborhood, you're asking people, hey, whom do you know and follow. But if you're doing research on digital media, you cannot do that. People don't know each other in certain neighborhood, right? If you go, you have, you probably could go online to understand how certain influencer online emerge and doing snowball sampling through those people. So if you are doing ethnography, it's not like a traditional so snowball sampling, but how to do snowball sampling differently by understanding the pattern that we collect online, which is, which is easier to do now, right? Because you see people, young people, for example, suddenly become, become prominent in certain movements, certain event, right? Like, for example, recently, right? Like whether it's a Katua Bem or, or, or a friend of his friend, his Jubir or whatever. So those are, we cannot find it through by using traditional method, but online though, you could, you could see because there are ways to collect, to mine data on that. So so data is not only just about new tools is big data or data science, or we are using different ways of mine data, but also is about, it's not about how individuals and communities are sorted, categorized and governed. So in a way to understand the data online is also to understand how different way communities are socially shape and reshape, right? It's about social structure, new social structure that might emerge. But also what we see online is not separated from offline world because what we see through data is how social world and social realities are represented. They are representation, the mirror of society. So they are refracted mirror sometime, right? Nevertheless, they are mirror. So we could understand them, that we don't really think them as like something separated from, from uh... and I think for me, I like doing small big data, the combination of small big data, because 
I'm doing research about uh, about I'm actually doing research at the margin, right? I'm not I'm not trying to understand the the I, I like to understand about activists, opposition, alternative, progressive, women, minorities, marginalized, underrepresented, which is statistical outlier. That is very hard to do in traditional way. It's expensive, right? Where to find people who belong to statistical outlier that are scattered all over the world or all over Indonesia. But online, you could do it because you, you could actually, uh, you could see small subset within the big data. Uh, and we cannot, we don't no longer treat minority experience as a deviation. They are actually reference category. And we could, we could have better theorization, better modeling precisely because, because have, we have better data now. And still doing that small data, which is understanding through, by immersing in deep data through whether it's ethnography, interviews and other things. So, so by having reflexive analog analytic dialogue between big data uh, and small data, right? I'm actually advocating the combination between the two, whether in, especially probably in sociology, sociology of communication, communication and media study, because we might be able to man historical erasure, that something that we cannot understand, right? Because is always patchy. Our represented data is always patchy because like small, like about activists, for example, like uh, sometimes I read dissertation, it's like interview of five activists. How could you understand that, right? But if that interview of five or 10 is combined with larger, right? So combination sort of like dialectic release between that and reading the pattern of larger data, we might be able to construct better understanding of human behavior, that we go beyond our case, that contribute to gen the more general understanding, not necessarily generalization, better understanding to understand similar phenomenon somewhere else. And I will just, uh, uh, I will not take too much time after this, but I will just show you a kind of methods that I use. So I was talking about that. So this is one of some, something, uh, this is from uh, Saudi women's driving uh, data. That's what we, I collaborated with a couple of colleagues and what we did was not just, was not just like mapping how people use Twitter. So this is like on Twitter, women's driving. Uh, but we we look because I knew there were plannings because I've been reading for years. There were like group of women who are doing different type of movements online, right? They're using fake names, you know, because they're so afraid to be arrested, but they were mobilizing. So we were seeding through blog and then find them on Twitter and then match the whole data. And what we do is longitudinal observation. So you knew, so you could see here that, that I, we had data, the map of tweets from they were small until it's exploded. Because I think to, to really map temporal, right, expansion, so to understand the case is not just when it is exploded, what what happened before. I think it's important. So this is what I'm talking about. The the I knew I knew this access through small data and generate big data in order to enter larger pattern, but also how it it's shifted through time. We're talking about different temporality, right? And Another one is Arab Arasan as an example, Tunisia for a Tunisian case, where to do research before, beyond just hashtag or social media, where I was able to talk, tra track the moment 
but also how moments become events and how to understand processes, which is not just event, not just like, okay, uh, certain days, certain month, but also the process, how it unravel, but also the trajectories. Uh, you could see here many people doing, this is just on Twitter, but I, I was actually doing beyond this. I was trying to track, this is my doodle. Uh, I'll, I was interviewing people and then trying to understand the relationship between Ali Bouazizi, who, who, who was the first to leak the photograph, right? And Bouazizi Samol, where, where was he? He was, he was at the, where was he what, at what time? And how he was interviewed by Al Jazeera, for example, how it went to Facebook and, and then how it went global. This is my original doodle while interviewing people in the field and and also and then how to put that within larger larger history that Tunisia has activism from 1999 right it's not just suddenly emerged people like oh suddenly care about democracy no there were there, there were many hundreds of hundred failed protests people that we didn't hear, we didn't know, uh, right? And also speaking of materiality here, you could see that this is actually a tracking like how different technology, Facebook, Reuters, friends, how it goes through different uh, type of technology. So this is, we, when we, t we talk about certain politics, it's not, it's not enough to just understand how it exploded on Twitter, but how it's actually sitting, the tweets sitting on larger media environment that allow it, allow the local to be global, right? How the local activism in city boss it become known globally and how it went back to the local and encourage activists in Tunisia to actually, um, it's another one, this is a, small big data which uh, from Malaysian Bersi that uh, I combine I found out through through following online for hours which is we were like 12 hour difference I was following because they were broadcasting the, the marching online and and I, at the same time I recorded the Twitter and then find out that most of tweet coming from people were actually gathered. So the, the Twitter, the tweet here is actually coming from, uh, that's uh, Independence Plaza, right? Where people actually really, and, and the, 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 the content of the tweets is like, hey, there is that water uh, cannon there's gas going to the lab, there is a route, you know, it's more like about how to, which is very different if compared to what happened in, in Egypt, for example, during the uprising in Cairo. People didn't tweet on, on the, uh, during the protest because most people didn't even have smartphone that could tweet. We are talking about Kuala Lumpur, Kuala Lumpur is over 80%, people were online. Right? So it kind of changed the way people behave here as well. Uh. Uh, professor, professor, professor Lin, uh, sorry yeah. to interrupt. I think you, you still have... I have one uh, minute, right? Right, <laughs> you're right. Yeah, yeah I think I have one I'm actually, I'm, I'm done. Yeah, so I'm okay, done. Okay, okay, thank you, thank you. Sorry, sir. Uh, so this is actually, so these are my last slide, right? So I think there is like different way and I, I have fun. Actually, I love my doing research and I, I love also to learn that I might be able to do different ways of research. Uh, and I think to be able to, to be open to different ways of, of doing research, but also to be open to what our, this is are not object. Our research subject sometimes direct our research. This is, this is my drawing, uh, this is my last slide from Hong Kong, which I didn't plan to do research on uh, migrant workers in Hong Kong, but I, I was there and chat with them. 
I I have fun. I I I draw for fun, not for research mainly. But when I draw, apparently it struck many people and they were chatting with me. They entrusted me their story. And at that moment, I was thinking like, oh, they want me to resist them, right? And I changed my research agenda because of that. So I think what I'm trying to do is here is that, so uh, I, I'm thankful for the opportunity. I think I really hope that what I was trying to tell basically show the complexity of it, that we will not be able to grapple with complexity without being very open to first methods, right? But also allow for the mundane, the everyday, and the specific, which is even to speak, all to speak to each other, allow us to also be within the research, within longitudinal, Right, long dure, not just some moment or care about some moment, but also to to care about the dialectic relationship, not just about technology and its impact, but how society itself is actually shaped, and allow ourselves to be a good observer, patiently look at this dialectic relationship through time and space. Thank you. <laughs>